A reading from the book of the prophet Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Set out for the great city of Nineveh and announce to it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah made ready and went to Nineveh, according to the Lord's bidding. Now Nineveh was an enormously large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began his journey through the city and had gone but a single day's walk announcing, Forty days more and Nineveh will be destroyed, when the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and all of them, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the ashes. Then he had this proclaimed throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles. Neither man nor beast, neither cattle nor sheep shall taste anything. They shall not eat, nor shall they drink water. Man and beast shall be covered with sackcloth and call loudly to God. Every man shall turn from his evil way and from the violence he has in hand. Who knows? God may relent and forgive and withhold his blazing wrath, so that we shall not perish. When God saw by their actions how they turned from their evil way, He repented of the evil that He had threatened to do to them. He did not carry it out. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. A heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. In the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sin cleanse me. A heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. A heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. For you are not pleased with sacrifices. Should I offer a burnt offering, you would not accept it. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit. A heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. A heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. While still more people gathered in the crowd, Jesus said to them, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. But no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. At the judgment, the Queen of the South will rise with the men of this generation, and she will condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And there is something greater than Solomon here. At the judgment, the men of Nineveh will arise with this generation and condemn it, because at the preaching of Jonah, they repented. And there is something greater than Jonah here. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, Lent is a call to open our hearts. And that they may be filled with attentiveness to the Word of God. You know, one of the reasons we give things up for Lent is to put distractions out of the way so that we may be better focused in mind and heart on God, listening more attentively. We try to give more time for prayer, extra Bible reading, extra masses that we go to, extra devotional prayers that we say, because we want to open the heart more to be responsive to the Word of God. He's speaking to us. He's preaching to us. He's calling us to repentance. He's calling us to deeper holiness. And the biggest obstacle in the way 
these readings are telling us today is indifference. We're not moved. We're not listening. We might hear, but we're not responding. Remember, at the last judgment, Jesus said, though some of those who will be condemned will be people who will say, but you preached in our streets. It's not enough that the word is being preached to us and is reaching our physical ears. The sin is indifference. Remember when Jesus said, this generation is like children in the square Shouting to each other, we piped you a tune, but you did not dance. We played you a dirge, but you did not mourn. Unresponsiveness. Gross is the heart of this people, Isaiah the prophet had said. They don't listen. Brothers and sisters, that's the sin of which we have to repent during Lent. In the Old Testament, expressed in the Proverbs and the Psalms, we read about the fool. And the fool in Scripture is portrayed as the one who, although an instruction is given to the fool, time and time again, there's no change. There's no response. Whereas, you know, the saying, a word to the wise suffices. In other words, to the wise person, it doesn't have to be repeated over and over and over again. You say the word once, you give the instruction once, they hear it once, they respond. It's sufficient to bring about the change that it's meant to bring about. This is an evil generation, Jesus said, and then he compares their lack of responsiveness to the very good responsiveness of the Ninevites, where we heard in the first reading, Jonah went out, Jonah was reluctant to go, and that's why he ended up in the belly of the whale, but then he went after the whale expelled him and, you know, he realized I better not run away from God's assignment here. And he went. But, you know, one of the reasons he hesitated, he said, oh, I'm afraid they might listen. And he was sort of like, oh, why should they get God's forgiveness? But they did. They were responsive. Hardly a day had gone by. And you saw what happened with the king's decree and everybody responding. Open heart. That's an open heart. An open heart is like the Queen of the South. I want to read for you the passage Jesus is referring to here. He says, The Queen of the South came to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. We read about this in the first book of Kings, in the 10th chapter. She's called the Queen of Sheba. Listen to this. The Queen of Sheba, having heard of Solomon's fame, remember Solomon has God for wisdom, and he granted it to him more than to any other person. Having heard of Solomon's fame, came to test him with subtle questions. So she wasn't quite sure, but she had heard enough to make this long journey and ask him questions, take the time and the trouble to see for herself. So it goes on to say in 1 Kings 10, She arrived in Jerusalem with a very numerous retinue and with camels bearing spices, a large amount of gold and precious stones. She came to Solomon and questioned him on every subject in which she was interested. King Solomon explained everything she asked about, and there remained nothing hidden from him that he could not explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba witnessed Solomon's great wisdom, the palace he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his ministers, the attendance and garb of his waiters, his banquet service, and the holocausts he offered in the temple of the Lord, she was breathless. Let me pause here. You notice how she was seeing everything? An open heart means open eyes and open ears. We must follow this example as we seek the Lord more deeply. Open eyes, open ears, open mind, open heart. She's ready to learn. She's willing to receive. She asks the questions. She hears the answers. This is how we have to be with the Lord. Verse Kings 10 goes on. She was breathless. The report I heard in my country about your deeds and your wisdom is true, she told the king. Though I did not believe the report until I came and saw with my own eyes, I have discovered that they were not telling me the half. Your wisdom and prosperity... Surpass the report I heard. Happy are your men. Happy these servants of yours who stand before you and always listen to your wisdom. 
Blessed be the Lord. See, then she refers it up back, back to God. Blessed be the Lord your God, whom it has pleased to place you on the throne of Israel. In his enduring love for Israel, the Lord has made you king to carry out judgment and justice. Then she gave the king a very large, uh, uh, 120 gold talents, a very large quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again did anyone bring such an abundance of spices as the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Now Jesus is saying, you have someone even greater than Solomon here. You think Solomon knew a lot? Look at Jesus. You think Solomon was wise? Jesus is wisdom incarnate. So the queen of Sheba, she made great sacrifices to truly open her eyes and mind and ears and heart to King Solomon. You need to be making even greater sacrifices to listen to one who is even wiser, holier, more consequential, King of kings, Lord of lords, God of eternity. Listen to him. Mary is praised in the scriptures as listening, pondering Jesus' words, treasuring them in her heart. The, the, the cloud that, that came down in the sky, the voice that was heard both at Jesus' baptism and again at the transfiguration has the Spirit descending on Him and the Father saying what? Listen to Him. This is the Lenten urgency. You know, Pope Francis wrote recently about the need to listen attentively, to be open in his message for this year's World Day of Communications, I want you to listen carefully to what the Pope says here. Because again, it's a lesson for us to imitate right in line with the example of the Ninevites and the Queen of Sheba. The Pope writes, The invitation to come and see which was part of those first moving encounters of Jesus with the disciples. Let me pause there. Remember when they were on the road, they weren't quite sure if they wanted to follow him. Rabbi, where are you staying? Instead of engaging in a discussion with them there in the middle of the road, he says, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Queen of Sheba had heard the report, but that wasn't the half of the truth, that she was willing to come and see. The Pope goes on. This is also the method for all authentic human communication. Listen carefully to what he says, because this is sorely lacking right now in the church and in our society. The Pope writes, it is necessary to move beyond the complacent attitude that we already know certain things. Don't we all think that? Oh, we already know what the gospel says. Oh, we already know the Lenten message. Oh, we already know the creed. Oh, I already know what that person's like. Oh, I already know what that ministry is all about. Oh, yeah, I've heard some negative things about those people. We can't associate with them. We already know. In our pride, in our arrogance, in our closed mind and hard heart, we don't take the time and the trouble to listen even more. We don't take the time and the trouble to say, maybe there's something new here for me to hear. The Pope says we think we already know certain things. And then he goes on to say, instead, we need to go and see them for ourselves. To spend time with people. To listen to their stories. And to confront reality, which always in some way surprises us. Isn't that what happened to the Queen of the South? And that's what needs to happen to us. It doesn't matter how long we've been following Jesus Christ. Most of us were raised in the faith, baptized as infants. We know, and yet there's always more to learn. You know what? The, I've always said the biggest temptation for a priest is not off to, to run off into some kind of, uh, with, with some woman or some kind of sexual sins. No, the biggest temptation is indifference. We take the sacred for granted. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's another day. Oh, it's just another mass. Oh, it's just another baptism. Oh, it's just another... What do you mean just another? Every one of these things is a miracle. Every encounter with Christ is an awesome, unbelievable moment, sacred, heart-thrilling moment, soul-energizing encounter. We must never get tired of it. There's no need to ever get tired of it. I don't know if you remember the Anglican minister... 
Joffrey Stoddard Kennedy wrote a poem called Indifference. He called it Indifference when Jesus came to Birmingham. Listen to this. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they hanged him on a tree. They drove great nails through hands and feet and made a calvary. They crowned him with a crown of thorns, red were his wounds and deep. For those were crude and cruel days, and human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to Birmingham, they simply passed him by. They would not hurt a hair of him, they only let him die. For men had grown more tender, and they would not give him pain. They only passed down the street and left him in the rain. The sin of indifference. Oh, there's nothing to see here. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, I can't be troubled to learn more about the Word of God, to learn more about this person in my life. I can't be troubled. We become indifferent to the evils in the world, settling in our mind with this idea that, oh, well, there's nothing we can do to change it. We come in, become indifferent to poverty. As if the gospel is just to say to the poor, oh, don't worry, God still loves you, rather than a force that will cause us to respond so that they are poor no longer. Or the evil of abortion, just to say, oh, well, you know, it's other people's choice and oh, there's nothing we can do about it. Instead of rising up with vigor every day and a determination to end this killing, to stop this violence, to stop this holocaust. And you know, sometimes we spiritualize our indifference. And we say, we put it in spiritual terms. Oh, well, you know, what really matters is that in the, you know, we're saving souls. Uh, you know, it's, we don't have to worry about the, these babies being physically dismembered. You know, it's really just about, you know, uh, saving uh, hearts and we spiritualize it. And so, no, we have to stop the physical killing. We have to actually feed the poor. We actually, actually have to house the homeless. We have to stop the violence, end the evil, not be indifferent and think that we can't change anything. This is what God is calling to, God is trying to arouse us during Lent. Like he aroused those Ninevites, like the queen of the south was aroused to come to see Solomon face to face. It happens with elections. We were just just came through a very contentious and consequential election. And I heard people of faith sometimes just over-spiritualizing everything. Oh, well, elections really don't matter because, you know, God is going to accomplish His will anyway. What do you mean they don't matter? Of course they matter. To the, to the, to the lives of the unborn, to the freedom of the church, it matters in a million ways. We can't spiritualize our indifference dress up our cowardice and laziness in spiritual language and rationalization. Let's let ourselves be awakened. Let's let our souls be stirred. Let's let our hearts be open. The man born blind, the Pharisees, they saw the miracle had never been heard of before that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. But no, they closed their hearts to Jesus. They would not believe it. They threw him out of the synagogue and anybody that will acknowledge Jesus. Ah, we already know. We already know who this man is. We know that he is a sinner, they said of Jesus. Like the Pope warned us about this, this attitude that we already know. Ah, we know this man is a sinner. He cannot possibly be from God. But the blind man didn't take that approach. He had an open heart so that when Jesus in the end asked him if he believed in the Son of Man, what he said was not, oh, I already know who you are. He said, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, it is I, and then he worshipped him. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus, final example that I'll use. The rich man went to hell, not because he was rich, but because he ignored Lazarus. And the rich man said, I have five brothers just like me. Let's go warn them 
And Father Abraham said, no, nobody has to go back from the dead to warn them. They have Moses and the prophets. In other words, the problem is that they, it was not that they, they didn't have the message that you have to help the poor and help the lowly and save the distressed. The problem wasn't that they didn't have the information. The problem was that their hearts were closed, that gross is the heart of this people, as Isaiah said. Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes back from the dead, then they will repent. And sometimes we are like that. Yeah, we have the word, and then again, it becomes, oh, you know, we get used to it. It becomes indifference. And we think, oh, but you know, if we saw a vision, you know, then we would listen. If Jesus were to come down and tell us exactly what to do, then we would listen. Then we would respond. Don't be so sure. If our hearts aren't open right now, if we're not responsive right here today to what might seem like the same old thing, the reading from the scripture, the same old gospel passage we heard, the same old prayers we always say, if we're not responsive now, don't be so sure would we, would, we would be more responsive then if someone appeared to us from heaven or came back from the dead. They have Moses and the prophets, Father Abraham said. Let them listen to them. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if one should rise from the dead. Lord, give us the responsiveness that the Ninevites had, that the man born blind had, that the queen of the south had, Give us that eager responsiveness and openness to what your word tells us today we must do and we must be. Change us and make us holy and help us to confront the evils of the world with the confidence that we can change that too. Lord, make us holy that we may have a truly meaningful Lent and a true encounter with you. Amen.